It's uh, good evening, not good afternoon anymore. But uh, before my first slide comes in, let me just uh, thank the two Royal Societies, uh, Shirt for funding uh, the research, as well as uh, Amelia and the technician for helping throughout the, uh, the event. Uh, so I've been interested over the last few years in uh, the issue of uh, digital culture and digital uh, technologies, but specifically uh, looking at the way in which uh, the use of social media platforms, as well as practices such as crowdsourcing, are transforming the way knowledge is being produced, created, evaluated and disseminated in society and the kind of controversies that are emerging out of this. And the first case study I'll be examining is that of climate change. Uh, what we've noticed uh, in terms of looking at this is the issue of uh, epistemic cultures that are built around a fundamental tension between participation that is becoming increasingly democratic and on the other hand, the fact that there is a kind of ambiguity in terms of the norms by which truth claims are being evaluated in our society. So what we've noticed is in the realm of criticism, uh, there's been a kind of crisis and redefinition of the role of the expert and of expert knowledges where traditional sources of criticism are being challenged by apps as well as by services such as Amazon that are aggregating the opinions of lay people and they're challenging the judgment of uh, so-called experts. Uh, but where this is a more graver implications is in the realm of, that many of you are familiar with, in the realms of uh, science, uh, notably uh, when it comes to medicine, when it comes to health, where uh, celebrities can have a great deal of traction and influence on public opinion, often more so than do traditional sources of scientific knowledge, and this is becoming quite a crisis. Now, this can have positive effects. Uh, the role of uh, people like uh, celebrities, or if you want, of uh, public figures such as the Pope, when it comes to climate change, has been quite substantive in terms of changing the terms of discourse, and in the social media world, they call this the impact of influencers on some of, of public opinion. But what we're seeing increasingly is the fact that in North America, at the very least, there's a great deal of confusion. So that while, as we all know, uh, almost all climate scientists agree about the anthropogenic nature of climate change, when it comes to the general public, that consensus is not nearly as widely shared. In fact, in Canada, it's less than 50% of the population that answers yes to the question, is climate change primarily caused by human activity? Uh, so I've been interested in looking at two kinds of case studies. The first one is an organization called No Consensus, which is based here in Canada, which is a climate change denial organization that uses practices of crowdsourcing in order to advance claims that the IPCC reports are not valid, as well as the fact that some of the scientists are biased. But there is also an important organization uh, based in the US out of MIT called the Climate Collab that also uses crowdsourcing but in a much more positive and constructive way in order to harness the public in terms of creating contests that can find very specific solutions to various climate change challenges. And the Climate Collab is a good model for this. Studying these two case studies, we can come up with a set of, if you want, principles that are emerging uh, that are part of these nascent epistemic cultures. And you can see them listed here uh, the, in terms of open openness of uh, evaluation as well as informalization, but also disputation of facts that are emerging in civil society generally. Now, the first principle, that of participative openness, it sounds fantastic, but in practice, certainly when it comes to no consensus, it's meant that there's been a concentration of participants amongst uh, the Anglo-American world as well as high-income countries as opposed to low or medium-income countries. So there's a definite lack of representativeness of the, the findings of the participants. Similarly, when we look at the qualifications of those who are participating in crowdsourcing groups such as no consensus, we can see based on this graphic that very few of them actually have qualifications to evaluate something like the IPCC uh, AR reports. Uh, in this case, you can see only 9.1% of the participants have a PhD in a STEM discipline. Uh, the, uh, the Climate Collab is a much more interesting model where they emphasize openness in terms of membership so anyone can join in principle. They have over 50,000 members, but that's also balanced out by the fact that they have both advisors as well as judges who are climate scientists who will help uh, members of uh, civil society guide them. If that's not the case, what happens is there's a kind of informality of participation uh, and in terms of epistemological understanding, which m leads to conclusions where uh, supposedly 40 citizen auditors can come up with uh, techniques that will invalidate the, uh, the work of the IPCC. This is completely absurd, but seems to gain some traction in some circles. So scientists in many ways need to try to make claims that will be advancing the importance of norms and practices of the scientific community, things like peer review, things like evidence-based research, which seems self-evident to many of us, but which amongst members of the general public are not necessarily so. 
Uh, if that's not the case, then we come at situations where facts and uh, theories are constantly under attack and disputed by, for instance, uh, groups that appear to be uh, grassroots but are in fact funded by large corporations. Uh, the Koch brothers in the United States are most uh, famous for this. The techniques that are used are astroturfing and crowd turfing. Uh, the Climate Collab uses a much more interesting model where the, even though they encourage public disputation and uh, is sometimes even conflict amongst the members, they also have expert arbiters who are climate scientists from around the world who can use uh, their judgment in terms of assessing truth claims. So the first principle that I've talked about needs to be tweaked. It's not simply about openness, but it should also be fundamentally about representativeness, to have ensure that those who are participating in crowdsourcing activities of this kind are representative of the general population, particularly when it comes to marginalized groups, whether in the global south or the global north. Uh, this is often something that's overlooked. But another thing that's important is disambiguation epistemologically, which is to say that there, have to be, there has to be an explanation of clear norms and principles by which we can evaluate truth claims, and also an understanding of the significance of clarity and reference so that members of the general public can participate in a much more robust way. That also signifies when we talk about uh, the third principle that it's not simply about uh, valuing disputation for its own sake, but also having informed public opinion that can deliberate. And so uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, two of his famous quotations are two of the ones that I, I like a great deal about the importance of scientific literacy, but also of baseline principles. So if I can just uh, end on this note, it's the fact that the three kinds of principles that have often been celebrated in the kind of libertarian formation that has emerged through uh, social media and crowdsourcing needs to be balanced out by a recognition of three more robust principles that can ensure that uh, the kind of crowdsourcing is both uh, that we understand is much more inclusive and also much more effective. Thank you. Great talk. Um, so where do you see the, the role of the traditional media here then? Are they, you've completely left them out, are they done and dusted? And no, I mean, the, the, the traditional media is extremely uh, important in terms particularly of science journalism. The problem, of course, is that most traditional news organizations are moving away in large instances from funding science journalism, not specifically because it's science journalism, but because as all disciplines of journalism are losing their kind of, uh, you know, the, the kind of uh, the funding model or the, the income generating model. So there are non-traditional journalistic sources that are emerging in the United States, uh, which will horrify some of you something like BuzzFeed, which actually does, is starting to invest in science journalism and science popularization, and that I think is extremely important. However, for members of the general public, often social media is a much more uh, powerful driver of decisions that they're making, uh, and in terms of understanding science. Whether we like that or not, that appears to be increasingly so, particularly uh, amongst uh, millennials and uh, generation, I guess now Z, uh, such, yeah. Um, how do you think we can fight back against this anti-intellectualism as scientists? I mean, I know I trip over it all the time. Do you have any uh, street tips or anything? For well, I mean, I think that, you know, the thing is, is that it's, it, members of the general public are, are, and I'm not someone who's a natural scientist, but I, I study the, the behavior of natural scientists, and I think part of the, the issue is that members of the general public are not necessarily aware of why things like peer review matter. They're not necessarily aware uh, as to why credentialization matters. Uh, and those kinds of things are things that scientists can explain and explain the stakes as to why that matters, much like you can talk about uh, you know, a great sportscaster, a sports person, a, a great chef, the kind of training that's required of that. Why is it that the scientific training has value in terms of evaluating evidence? And I think that that's something which we tend to take for granted, that it is self-evident because we're academics, uh, researchers, but perhaps members of the general public don't necessarily necessarily uh, grasp as easily as, as we do. So perhaps that's one thing. But of course, the other thing too is that, uh, you know, there are large corporate interests uh, that are, of course, countering this, and we have to also be aware of that. There's a kind of whole political economy, I know that's a, a, a topic of discussion for tomorrow, but around this where the interests of uh, large corporations and, and uh, private interests is such to confuse the public, so that particularly when it comes to climate change, there's a lack of action based on that confusion. So. We have time for one more question. Uh, yeah. Badly, yay. Um, uh, 
Well, there's also a question here about um, who who is or is not expert on what, because you know, so whether something it does or does not exist, like climate change, sure, yes, we we have a lot of scientific evidence, and maybe we should believe that. But there's also a lot of value judgments. What do I do about climate change? Right. And, uh, you know, we, we trust the climate scientists, but they're not like me. They don't understand a lot of the elements I'm dealing with, and my neighbor has a better sense of that, and they seem to be more technical than me, so why wouldn't I trust them? Yeah. And so how do you kind of bring that into this element? Well, I mean, I think that the, the embedding of uh, public opinion in particular kinds of political cultures and scientific cultures is extremely important. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm not denying that that plays a role. It's not as though members of the general public are isolated from their lived experiences, but at the same time, part of the problem is that, um, you know, natural science appears to, again, members of the general public to be something that's separate from what they see in their everyday life. So explaining that and the significance of why uh, scientific norms and rules can matter and that perhaps, you know, people who they also know, their friends and so on, may not be necessarily always the best judges of evidence around climate change, you know, whether it's warmer uh, this year or this month as opposed to last year or last month, may not be the best indicator or not whether or not this climate change. So that has to happen. But one of the things that we know is that in, in when it comes certainly to political behavior, voting behavior, the most influential thing is word of mouth. And so that has to be, and, and you know, scientists are also people and they can influence that as well. And I think that that's really important.